think one of the biggest challenges in the fight against gender-based violence is data. And you'd often find in the public domain, everybody having their own view in terms of what is the root cause. So some people will say it's alcohol. Um, the other day I heard a, a, a religious leader saying it's a demonic spirit. Some people will believe it's um, the choice of bad girlfriends. Um, there are many people who believe it's women who are financially dependent on men. So we all have our own opinions about what the drivers are. And what we wanted to achieve was really to add to the body of knowledge and data around what the key drivers of sexual and gender-based violence is. There is a general concern that the problem of gender-based violence in Namibia has reached significantly high prevalence. Yet social responses to this problem are not only fragmented, but it also lacks a strong base of research evidence to back them up. I think that's something that we need to acknowledge is the pervasiveness of violence. Um, violence is within our households. Um, it's within our daily experiences, our daily interactions. Sometimes even uh, micro forms of violence. Um, those violence, those forms of violence that go unnoticed, I think they prime us to a certain extent to accept violence in our communities, in our homes, in our workplaces in our society and I think that we have to learn to uh, cultivate an intolerance for violence. The way that we were raised, we were raised as, as young people, we were raised knowing that when you did something wrong, you have to be reprimanded or being punished in the violent way been beaten, you broke a, a bottle or the glass or the plate at home, then you have to be permitted in the way of being clapped or being beaten. That's what the, the when, when, when you reprimand a person in the way of beating the person, you are, you, are to, 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 you are telling that person that no, this is the way that you have to solve your problem. Um. I, I, grew up, I grew up in a very beautiful family. Um, I would lie if I say there was really violence in, within the family, but per se, in the community, there was that violence. And um, when I grew up, I, I never got involved into um, crime. I never drink since I was born. Um, I was actually not a, a problem child per se. But, uh, you know, um, after completing my school, um, I only realized when I committed this crime that I had underlying anger problems that was never addressed. But and even nobody within the family told me that I had problems. But, you know, as my sentence goes, I have realized from some family members that, you know, I, I, I was a little bit a bully within. You know, I wanted to be top within my play groups. Mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, it, it, it was an underlying anger problem mm -hmm. yeah, that contributed to where I am today. Another theme within the research was the role of parental skills and guidance. And this was particularly important when it comes to problem solving. Many of the research participants spoke to the lack of guidance that they received uh, as they were growing up in terms of anger management, uh, platforms that they were able to to gain uh, growing up when it comes to articulating various range of emotions. So for instance, perpetrators, especially male perpetrators, spoke to the fact that as they were growing up, uh, aggression was more permissible uh, as opposed to sadness. They weren't able to articulate loss, even a loss of a loved one. They felt that they didn't have the space to do so. And all of this really precipitated their inability to communicate in adult years and problem solve effectively in the context of relationships.
I met a lot of young people who are, I'm asking them, why are you not looking for help? Why are you trying to commit suicide with this small problem that you have? The person say that I, I, I've been telling this problem to my friend and my friends, they, the only things that they are doing, they are telling me that, no, I'm weak. What, how can I even cry because of that? How can I do what? We are just, we're having judgmental community. And one will be afraid of asking for help or searching for help because of judgmental community that we are having. If we want to, and that's also, that's caused people to go commit suicide. If you see the people they are committing suicide in our society, that's a cause. The people they cannot be open up with their problem that they're having because there is no ears that is ready to, to hear them. The only, hear, the, the, the only ears that is there is to hear them and go spread the, 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 the rumors and, uh, and gossips. So we have to teach our people that no, when a person comes to you with his or her problem, it means that the person trusts you. You got to help where you can. Um, we, we, we grew up in, in a setting where boys don't cry. When, 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 when something happens, you come back crying, you will be beaten. You are not even given a chance to explain what happened. So that makes it difficult for, 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 for a man to stand up and say, my wife is doing this. My girlfriend is doing this or my friends are doing this because you are regarded as as the head you don't cry you don't have problems so if that change and in, in if there are interventions that men can open up now or, or there are platforms where men can open up yeah without being being judged because yeah. at the beginning there's a lot of push and pull um, from the people who are supposed to be sort of on your side. Um, there was a lot of doubt from their side and uh, I think for me what was not nice, it was the fact that they don't wait for you to leave to, to talk about these doubts. They literally just say it out loud in, in your presence. Um, there was not any privacy. I'm a very private person, very, very private. Uh, but so of course, and also just in my head, I don't know, maybe too much TV, I don't know, but I'm just expecting if I'm going to report something as serious as this, I want to be put in a room, maybe with like maximum two people, just, you know, so that I can speak. I don't want to be pushed from one place to another and like, you know, you are in an area where anybody can walk in. For me, I felt like that was really unprofessional and um, as a person with rights, I felt like I have a right to privacy and I didn't have that. Um, you know, when you are walking out of there and people are talking about your case in the corridor, Normally at the, at the police stations, I heard from people, I never witnessed it, but I heard from people that police, they start loving at you that, how can, what kind of men are you? How can you run from your home because of a woman? And you can't report the woman. And this man, when he heard these kind of things, he will run straightly to, 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 to build it and buy a panga and go chop that woman. So one way or another, police also, they are contributing to gender-based violence in that form. So we've, when, when we open our arms, our arm as, as, as a police, we have to open our arms for everyone. We must not cry gender-based violence, gender-based violence, but we are, the, 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 the cause of it some, somewhere how in, in, in the process. One of the key things that we also need to do around help seeking is a lot of people seek help from their friends and family, especially young boys. So it's really strengthening the peer support system so that with the correct information, so that when a friend, for example, seeks help from another friend, they have the correct information, they have the correct uh, referral system that they can be able to refer their friend to. And it's really leveraging that power of the peer support system to be able to strengthen help seeking behavior. My own observation about, about uh, gender-based violence is that um, it, it has got this um, intergenerational cycle it, it follows, you know, people are growing up within this thing and it is, it's not addressed. There is no mechanism that address this thing until you come to prison. And when it is addressed, um, it only affects 
us who are already sentenced. Because when they change laws, it affects us, people who are already sentenced. It doesn't affect the would-be criminals or person who, who, who is planning to commit a crime. I, I tell my friends that, you know, I actually don't regret coming to, to prison because it has, it has done me good. Uh, the opportunities that I have been given by a Namibian Correctional Service, I would never had. Never, I would never had it. I, I could never have, have it outside because they have created. They made me who I am today. Because when I when I came to when I was sentenced, um, I only had a, a, a diploma in education, and I was given opportunity to upgrade myself to a bachelor degree. I upgrade myself to a master's degree, and you know, um, really correctional facility, they are trying with limited resources, you know. The last thing I think is we should internalize it and not deflect it to say, but sexual and gender-based violence is something out there, and it's, it's not for me. So what is it that I can do in my sphere of influence to make it better? What is it that I can do on a daily basis and be intentional about for us to reduce the harmful effects of sexual and gender-based violence? That when we recognize the stories being told by perpetrators, we start to recognize perpetrators as our brothers, our uncles, our cousins, our nephews, our fathers, our teachers, our pastors, our employers. There are no exemptions with who can be a perpetrator of gender-based violence.